So, uh, this projector is slightly off screen. Just the remote. Seriously. Okay, guys. So, uh, how's everyone doing? So far, so good. All right. Sounds good. What did you get? You did uh, enumerables this morning, it looks like? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, this afternoon is classes uh, and object oriented stuff. Uh, there's going to be a lot of terminology in this class. So, a lot of terminology in this class. Uh, and going along with that, um, well, the nice thing about this terminology is that it's terminology that's going to apply in pretty much every programming language. So we're going to talk about instance, method, uh, instance methods, instance variables, class methods, class variables. These are things that pretty much every programming language has. If I could have it my way, like, I would just say, like, no computers in pretty much any class. Like, I, I would, like, I'm not going to tell you guys to close your computers, but, like, um, someone pointed out in the last class that they uh, were like trying really hard to take notes and everything and then they felt like every time they looked down to take notes and then looked up they had already missed something. Um, and so I would say that just because we do have pretty thorough lesson plans I think, um, I would encourage you to try not taking notes. Um, I think it tends to be more sort of a security blanket for people. It could be wrong. Obviously, you know yourselves better than I do. Um, but also, like, if, you know, we're, if you've come this far and you feel like you're still not getting things and you've been taking notes all along, maybe try not taking notes. Try something different. I don't know. But at any rate, it's up to you. Just because we're going to be going over a lot of stuff, um, yeah, just keep your wits about you and please do ask questions when you have them. Um, which, I mean, you totally can use your computers. I'm not going to go around and, like, slap anyone's shut. But um, just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, so uh, you guys already learned about object-oriented JavaScript. Object-oriented Ruby is honestly a lot simpler. It's not as weird as object-oriented JavaScript is. That's because JavaScript wasn't really written to be object-oriented. I mean, you can do it, but it wasn't really intended to be that way. Whereas in Ruby, Ruby was very much written to be object-oriented. And so Ruby tries to sort of grease the wheels on that a bit more. Uh, so what does object-oriented mean? Uh, and I know you guys already have like your definitions of that. But for the course of this class, I'm going to say that object-oriented means, well, it doesn't mean that your code is just one big long sequence of events. It doesn't mean that your computer just sort of starts at the code and just sort of goes line by line by line and then it's done. That's called procedural code. That's code that's usually written in scripting languages. JavaScript is considered a scripting language. It has script right in the name. When people talk about scripting languages, they usually mean like your code is just one big Rube Goldberg machine. And I know I've talked about those before. Rube Goldberg machines are the ones where like you water the plant and it grows and it hits a lever and it makes like a chicken lay an egg, which like rolls down a chute, which opens the newspaper for you or something. Uh, it's kind of like that, where it's just this big, long butterfly effect series of events and consequences, cause and effect. Object-oriented code is not like that. It's not just you start here and then you go through it A to Z until you get to the end. Instead, object-oriented means your code isn't just a bunch of instructions. It's sort of a story about different objects. It's a whole bunch of little machines that interact with each other. And so you're doing two things. One, you're defining what those machines are and what, you, what they can do. And two, you're basically writing the story about how the machines talk to each other. So an example of an object-oriented thing in real life would be a car. Uh, so your car is like one big machine made up of a bunch of little machines. It has an engine. It has something called a solenoid. And I only know that because I had to get it replaced. It has a muffler, It's got a, which isn't a machine, I think. I don't know anything about cars, but my understanding, <laughs> my understanding is that cars are actually a bunch of little machines that all sort of talk to each other. Um, and they all sort of talk to each other and make this one big thing that works. You know, it's just like the human body, like we got mitochondria and 
well, okay, I don't know anything about the human body either, but we've got a whole bunch of like little bacteria vacuoles. and things. Yeah, vacuoles and vesicles, endoplasmic reticulum. I don't know what that is, but I remember that word. Um, yeah, all these little machines are just sort of talking to each other to make this big, beautiful, wonderful thing that is you. Um, so that's, well, now it sounds really anticlimactic. That's what we're going for with Ruby. We're going to create the human body. No, not really. Um, but we're going to be making these things where it's just a bunch of little machines talking to each other. Uh, okay, so uh, during this class, we're going to be talking about classes. Uh, and so a class is something that JavaScript does not have. A class in Ruby is the blueprint for an object. So I'm going to start writing this up. A class is the blueprint for an object. And so an instance of an object is made from that blueprint. And you could also say an object is an instance of a class. So the three big words here are object, instance, and class. And then blueprint. Blueprint's not like actually one of the programming terms here, but a blueprint is what a class really is. These three things are all true. Uh, and this is about as far as I'm going to go for like what the definitions of objects are. Uh, during this class, I'm going to treat instance and object as basically the same thing. An object is an instance of a class, uh, and an instance is an object made from a class. Those basically mean the same thing. Um, so instance and object are basically the same thing, and they're both made from a class. And a class, that's just like the blueprint for a particular object. So we're going to talk about what exactly this looks like. Um, but first, let's talk about how to get some objects to begin with. So whenever I'm making an app, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it object-oriented, the way I start is I just like, well, okay, this isn't the way I actually start, but if I was, I was a good person who practiced what he preached, uh, what I would do is I would sort of put in a sentence what I want my app to be, and then I would look inside that sentence for key nouns. And those nouns are what I would use for my objects. So for instance, the examples I have here, tic-tac-toe is a game where players try to get three squares in a row. This is like way oversimplified, but it's a good like nutshell version to start off with. And from this, I get three nouns. I get game, players, and squares. And I might treat those as my objects, with play, game, players, and squares. Uh, with Garnet, uh, Garnet is a site where students can track their homework and attendance. I get three objects from that, students, homework, attendance. I also get site, that could be a fourth object. Uh, and then with Amazon, Amazon is a site where people, place, or where people can order products. People, orders, and products. It's not that there has to be three objects with every single site. This is, these just happen to be the three that I came up with. Uh, but do you see, sort of see what I'm going for with that pattern in there? How there are sort of those key nouns, and those would be the objects that I use or, or that I start to make blueprints of when I actually start developing this stuff. Uh, one thing to notice here is that each one has sort of a human object, players, students, and people. And those would be my user objects. I would call those users instead of those names. Users is just sort of a catch-all phrase for someone interacting with your app, as you all know. Um, so what I'm going to do sort of as the in-class example for this class is define a user class. And then we're going to make instances of the user class. We're going to make user objects. So to start off with, let me show you how to create a class. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to be typing pretty fast here. So this is another one of those things where I would encourage you just to uh, just to sort of watch and like see if you can recognize the patterns in it. There will be plenty of opportunity to practice this later on, but your call. Uh, let's see, that is the wrong place. All right, so here's my Ruby file. 
to create a class, to create the blueprint for users, you just write class user end. And now I have a user class. Uh, so one thing to note already is that this has a capital letter. There are really only two things that can begin with capital letters in Ruby, constants and classes. And classes actually are a kind of constant. We're not going to talk about what constants are probably again, just because they don't get used that often, but we will be talking about classes a whole lot. If you try to do something like, you know, um, if you have a method, and you try to do something like name equals one, then it's probably going to throw an error at you because you're trying to do something with a capital letter and Ruby is like, oh sweet, that's a constant or a class, but you're not using it as a constant or a class, so it doesn't know what to do. So the only thing that could be capitalized in Ruby is class names. The only thing that could be capitalized is class names. All right, so uh, me having done this, I'm going to put this in pry. It's going to require pry. Um, and I have this weird thing when I try to run something in pry where it doesn't like catch this binding dot pry. Like it should have stopped in the middle of that. And it doesn't unless I have some random piece of code after it. So random piece of code. And now it'll actually stop and it'll let me do pry stuff. I don't know why this is. For like half the class, it doesn't seem to do this. For the other half, it does seem to. So if pry is never working for you, then it may be you just need to like just put a puts in the end. I just can't have it as the last thing in my file. There's got to be something after it. OK, so I've created this. Uh, user. So now I could say Juan equals user dot new. And now I got this guy. So what I've done is I've just created a new instance of the user class. I've created a new user object. There's not really anything to it yet. I mean, this is pretty bare in here. But whenever you create a new instance of a class, you're going to do it with dot new. In Ruby, every class is instantiated with dot new. And so now I have Juan, and he can't really do anything, but I can see that Juan's class is user. I can see that Juan is an instance of user. In fact, I think I can do Juan is a user. Now this isn't going to work. Oh, cool, it did work. So I can say Juan is a user. Juan is a monkey should be, well, uninitialized constant monkey. It's saying there isn't a class called monkey. There is one called user, but there's not called monkey. I could say one is a string. That's going to say, nope, he is not. All right, so aside from the fact that we haven't actually done anything with classes so far, uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. It seems like this is exactly what constructors do in JavaScript, right? They're just using in JavaScript like a function, which is something that already existed to do what is a separate thing in Ruby. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to sort of get away from like saying this in Ruby is like that yeah, in JavaScript yeah. because sometimes I can make things way more complicated. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Okay, so let's make this class actually do something. Uh, I'm going to type this in. I was created. One thing to remember about pry is that pry can't detect when you've changed your code. So if you want to test out this new code that you've written, you have to quit and restart pry, which is what I'm doing now. Now, if I do one equals user.new, check out what happens. I get I was created. So this instantialize, initialize, excuse me, this initialize method, this is a really special method. It's special because initialize is called whenever dot new is called. So whenever you call dot new, it also calls initialize. And so if I do this one equals user dot new a bunch of times, or like Steve equals user dot new, or just plain old user dot new, it calls initialize every single time. So initialize and dot new are basically the same thing. This kind of sucks because initialize and dot new are completely different letters. Uh, and this is the only situation in which you're going to run into anything like this in Ruby. But that said, initialize and dot new are the same thing. It doesn't matter where in your class you put initialize, dot new is always going to call initialize if it's there. 
If it's not there, there's no problem. That's what I was doing before. But if it is there, it's going to call this initialize method. All right. So this, I would say, is like the constructor function in JavaScript, this initialize. It's a piece of code that's run whenever you create a new instance of this class. Initialize is run whenever you create a new instance of this class. Aside from the weird naming, though, initialize is really just like any other method, which means you can give it arguments. So for instance, I can give it a name argument, and then I can have it say, whoops, my name is name. And now I just changed my code, so I have to quit and restart. And now if I do Juan equals user dot new Juan, it should say my name is Juan. And there we go. If I say Steve equals user dot new Steve, it'll say my name is Steve. So this is pretty important that you can pass stuff in to initialize. Uh, and I could also do a first name and a last name. It's just like any other method except for the naming thing in that you can give it however many uh, arguments you want. So during this class, we're going to be using Juan Wanson. <laughs> now I got my name is Juan Wanson. And so it's letting me pass in both of these arguments and then it's spitting them back out. So questions so far? I feel like so far this looks a lot better than JavaScript. Um, or at least, I don't know, to my mind it makes a lot more sense than JavaScript. The only thing that's weird is the initialize thing. So far, to my mind, that's the only thing that's weird is that initialize happens when you do dot new. But if you think about what initialize means, initialize means like create a new instance of something. Uh, and so that's exactly what's going on here. It's the same thing here. If I check Juan in his class, he's still a user. Yeah, what's up? Do you like, make that a different word that, uh, that initial put there initialize? It's got to be initialized. Yep. Yep, it actually has to be initialized. I mean, again, you don't have to have it in here. Right. Um, but if you do, if you do have def initialize, then it's going to do that. So that's only if you want something to happen when you create the instance. Exactly. Yep, it def initialize is only if you want something to happen when you do user.new. If you don't want anything to happen when you do user.new, you don't need initialize. But if you do, you do need initialize. So yeah, what's up? So objects in JavaScript are hashes, but objects in Ruby are not hashes. And so that's a pretty weird thing, is that in JavaScript, everything is a hash, basically. Uh, whereas in Ruby, hashes are very much their own distinct thing. Uh, if I check whether or not if Juan is a hash, it's going to tell me, no, Juan is not a hash. Hashes are only these guys. Ooh, are. A hash is like an object literal. Yes, that's exactly right. A hash is an object literal. Uh, if I do hash is a hash, now I get true. So the only things that are hashes, hashes and, and objects in Ruby are completely different things. Hashes and objects are completely different things. If you want to mince words though, technically everything in Ruby is a kind of object. So if I do hash is a object, I think this will work. I get true. If I say name equals Robin, the name is a object, that is also true. It's a string. Yeah, well, it's a string and it's an object. If I do have methods, there are string methods there. Yeah. Exactly. If I do, yeah, and we've seen that with hash. So what this means, if something is an object, that means it has methods and it has properties. It has attributes. Every string has methods in Ruby like upcase, or downcase, or reverse. These are all methods of instances of strings. So each of these is an instance of the string object, the string class, uh, and these are the methods that they have. So I know it's weird, so I'm not going to get into that a whole lot.
The important thing is that this is how you create your own classes. All right, so I've got that. Uh, but the problem with this is that I like pass in the first name and the last name here, and then when the user is first created, it says my name is Juan Wanson, but then nothing really happens with that first name and last name. They just sort of go in there, and then it prints them out, and then it's done. And that user doesn't really have any more information. So in order to make that information really stick about the user, uh, I have to explicitly say first name is an attribute of the user. Last name is an attribute of the user. Here I'm not saying they're attributes. I'm just saying this is something that you're going to use right now. But I'm not saying these like actually are part of the user. In order to do that, I'm going to use the at symbol. You've got at for attribute. This is saying I am creating a first name attribute uh, that is taking as its value first name. It doesn't have to be called first name. It could be called wombat. It can be called whatever you want. But last name makes a little bit more sense. Let me just show you what this looks like now. Oops, forgot to put pi back in there. All right, so now if I do Juan equals user dot new Juan Juanson, now my user looks a little bit different. Now my user has these two things in it. It's showing me all the different attributes that this particular user instance has. So then it has two attributes, first name and last name. And now if I look at Juan again, they're still there. So now these are like part of Juan. Now Juan has a first name and a last name and they are stuck with him. Uh, so now I've given him some actual properties, if you will, some actual attributes. So if I were to do at wombat equals last name, then it would be the same thing. Juan equals user.new, Juan, Juanson. And now I just got at first name equals Juan, at wombat equals Juanson. So there's nothing wrong with that, except that it's not very easy to read. If I saw that in code, I wouldn't know what's going on. Um, so I'm just going to leave it called last name. But the reason I'm sort of harping on this is because people tend to think that these have to be named the exact same thing, and they don't. You can call them whatever you want. I'm just calling them first name and last name because, to my mind, that just sort of makes the most sense. So what it's referring to is the first part of the attribute. Exactly. Yep. So this at first name is getting its value from here, which is getting its value from here. And this, uh, which is getting its value from here. Uh, well, I mean, I can't do like, you know, fruit fly in here because that's not going to work. It has to Right, it'll say fruit fly is undefined. I mean, I can do this in whatever order I want. The order doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, I have to use these variables that were created up here. Well, actually, even that's sort of a lie. I mean, I can say at last name equals, well, here, I'll just do fruit bat in here. And now, no matter what I try to name my user, he's always going to be, their last name is always going to be fruit bat. So if I do Alexa equals user.new, Alexa, I don't even know your last name, so I'll put McGillicuddy. You're now Alexa Fruit Bat. <laughs> but I can't really think of any reasons I would want to do that, so I'm just going to stick with last name. Did I spell your name right? Is it like some weird spelling? Okay, cool. I'm not sure if it's no, like. Name, You're not McGillicuddy? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, cool. So what does this mean that these are actually attributes? The thing is, now I can do other stuff with them. So what I mean by that is, like, I could create a full name method, and I can have it say at first name, uh, at last name. And so now, let me run this guy again. Now I can do name. And I get Juan Wanson. So I've done two things here. Uh, one is I've created a new method for instances of user. I've also 
used these uh, attributes somewhere else. So one thing, the reason that this at symbol is important is because if I do something like favorite animal equals fruit bat here, I can't access it down here. And let me just try favorite animal. Uh, and just so I don't have to type this all the time, I'm just going to put one right here. I'll try that again. One dot full name. It throws an error. It says undefined local variable or method favorite animal. The thing about variables in Ruby is that local variables, that is anything without an app in front of it, only exists inside the method in which it was created. So I need to draw a little diagram up here because this part's a little more complicated. So I'm going to say. Great juggling of the black markers. Here we have class, user, I don't want to make that, uh, dev, name, um, food equals pizza. I know this is like totally a contract example. I'm just like thinking of random stuff right now. Def, whatever. And then I'm actually going to write these guys in different colors so that I can show you where you can access these different variables. So I'm going to put food back in here. And I can only access food inside here. Then I'm going to put age in here, and then these will go here. And I can access age anywhere in here. So this is the difference between local and instance variables in Ruby. Local variables can only be used, they can only be accessed inside the method in which they were created. Instance variables or attributes can be accessed all the way through an entire class. So I can access at age down here. I can't access food down here, but I can access at age down here. And it's the same thing over here. I can access favorite animal in here, but I can't access favorite animal down here. I can access at first name and at last name anywhere in this entire class. So that's not going to work. But this full name and last name should work fine. So I should be able to do Juan.fullName and get Juan Watson. Questions about this? Yeah, um, Adrian. It's not defined the class user or instance. Uh, so the class of user, this isn't the instance. This is the blueprint for instances. But it's not We're getting to that. Hold that. Hold that thought. We're getting to that. Jumping ahead just a little bit, I think. But any questions about like this variable scope thing? Okay. Do you have to include the at in the full name? Do you include that like on that very same variable? Uh, like right here? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so if I don't do that, then it's going to look for first name equals something in here. It's going to look for a local variable called first name, and it's not going to find it. So uh, yeah, if I just leave it like this, then it should throw an error. Find that full name, and it says undefined local variable or method first name. If I put that back in there, then it's going to work just fine. So that at like really is part of the variable's name. It's like really in there. You have to include it anytime you want to talk about that local variable up there. I mean, that, that instant variable. All right, so now getting to what Adrian was talking about. Um, one thing about instances in Ruby is that all you have access to is the instance's methods. What I mean by that is, like, I've got these attributes right here, first name and last name, but I can't do one.first name. I get undefined method. I can't do one.last name. I get undefined method. I can do one.fullName perfectly fine because I have a method called fullName. 
but I can't do first name and last name. That's not going to work. So going along with that, how could I, like, let's say I wanted to be able to do Juan.first name. How could I get Juan's first name? What could I do for that? Yeah, define a new method. Okay, uh, what could I call that method? The first name. Okay, and then what would I put inside it? Yeah, nice. That is exactly right. Thanks for letting me, oh, thanks for putting yourself on the spot like that. So now I can do Juan.firstName. And now that works perfectly fine. This is what you have to do in order to get properties out of an instance in Ruby. You have to use a getter method like this. It's a shortcut that we'll get to later on. But if you want to get Juan's first name, you have to do it like this. Everything has to go through a method. The only thing you have access to is methods. You don't have access to properties or anything unless they go through a method just like this. And can someone reiterate for me why I don't need to put return here? What is it about Ruby? It's an implicit return. The last line will automatically return. Yeah, exactly. The last, the last calculation specifically that Ruby made in a method gets returned. So the last thing that's calculated here is whatever first name is. So that's the thing that gets returned, which is why Juan.firstName gives me Juan. I haven't done that with last name, so Juan.lastName is still going to throw in here. So the only thing you have access to inside instances of a class are its methods. It's the only thing you have access to. So if you want to be able to access any of its properties, you have to define getter methods like this. This doesn't have to be called first name. I mean, this could also be called Wombat. Uh, and then to get Juan's first name, I would type what? Wanda Wombat. Wanda Wombat. God, that's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, in the other class, he came up with Wombats, but I thought that was funny. Yeah, when he was like, mm, it's too late after lunch. So it doesn't matter what this is called, but I think first name makes no sense. I thought Wombat was funny for both of you guys. first name, and there you go, Juan. Are there questions about that? All right, so we've seen a lot of things so far. We've seen instance variables, methods, initialize, dot new, uh, passing in arguments, and we've also seen getter methods, which is what we're doing here, getter methods. So what's the other side of getter methods? Setter methods. Setter methods, yeah. So it would be nice if I could change Juan's first name by saying Juan.firstName equals Steve, but that's going to throw an error at me can't do that. If I wanted to be able to change Juan's first name, then I could just, well, what would I have to do? Create a method. Okay, what should I call this method? How about set first name? And then what am I going to need to do to this in order to make it work? How am I going to get information into this method? Pass it an argument. Cool, so I'll call it name. And then down here, I'm just going to change this instance variable this attribute. I'm going to say at first name equals name. And well bam, now I have a setter method. So if I run this again, I have name equals Juan Wanson. Now I can say name Steve. Now if I do name, I get Steve Wanson. So this changed the attribute and it changed it everywhere in this class. From this point out, excuse me, everywhere in this instance. From this point out, until I change it again, Juan's first name is Steve. And anytime it does anything with at first name, it's going to be Steve. So I've changed it everywhere. But I'll change it back to Juan. There we go. And now it's back. So now I have a getter method and a setter method. I have two ways of interacting with these pieces of data. Adrian, is this answering the question that you had earlier? Okay, cool. All right, the downside, well, there's one big downside of having to do this. What is that? Yeah, exactly. You gotta write a lot of crap. And ain't nobody got time for that. I'm an important person, so I'm gonna use shortcuts. Uh, Ruby comes built in with this shortcut. It's called adder accessor. Uh, what does adder stand for? Attributes. Attributes, exactly. 
Uh, so if I type adder accessor first name, actually, let me do this in parentheses to start. If I do adder accessor first name, what this does is it creates both a getter and a setter method for me. So it does exactly what I just did, except it does it for me. So I don't have to write def first name and def set first name. I don't have to do all that stuff. So now if I do this again, now I can do Juan.first name, and it'll give me his first name. And I can do Juan.first name equals Bippin. Now if I do Juan.full name, I get Bippin Wanson. And so it gave me those getter and setter methods right off the bat without me having to do anything for it. If I wanted to do that for last name, then I'll just plop it in here. Adder accessor is just a, a method that you can call inside a class like this. So now if I quit and restart, now I can say Juan.full name should be Juan Monson. Juan.last name equals Brontosaurus. And now if I do Juan.full name, I should get Juan Brontosaurus. There we go. And if I change his first name, I should get Steve Brontosaurus. There we go. So now you have getter and setter methods for both of these. Uh, one thing to note is that the simple comes, so adder accessor is really just a method. So it's just going to be adder accessor parentheses. There's no colon right here. There's no colon. It should be a happy face, not a frowning face. It wouldn't if, if the colon was underneath. So it's a happy face. Questions about that? Yeah, what is the word accessor? Accessory? Yeah, good question. So, uh, well, accessing something is just like being able to access it. Uh, and in this case, it's just saying, hey, we can access this attribute. We can change it, we can get its value, we can do whatever we want to this attribute. Um, which I think is the rationale behind that. So you create the class, you decide what people are going to be able to access. Exactly. Set that right there. Yep, yeah. exactly. Other questions? So where are we at in here? Went through instance variables, getting in setting. Okay, so uh, even jumped ahead a little bit. Why don't we take a break for 10 minutes, and then after that, we'll come back and start this exercise. So come back at, uh, let's say, 25. That's eight minutes.